Hi, I'm Amy Cardoso and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Blanton Museum of Art and our interviewer, Kay Yoland, speaks with curator Claire Howard about the exhibition, Making Africa, a Continent of Contemporary Design. Now for Art This Week. Hi, this is Art This Week, and today we're at the Blanton Museum of Art with the managing curator, Claire Howard, for the exhibition, Making Africa. Thanks so much for joining me Thank today. You. Yeah. So I wanted to start with um, the first room in this exhibition. So it's, it's set up as four sections, if I understand correctly, and you might take me through that. The first room's the prologue, and that really kind of sets the scene mm -hmm. for some of the questions and the philosophy and ideologies here. Um, how is that room important for how audiences and the West might be actually kind of entering into this exhibition? Yeah, the prologue um, begins with a work uh, or a series of works called Sea Stunners by Cyrus Kibiru, who's a Kenyan artist. Um, and they're eyeglasses sculptures made out of found objects and detritus that he collects on the street of Nairobi. Um, but in this exhibition, they they perform a really kind of metaphorical role as, as kind of the entrance to the show um, in that they prompt us to think about the preconceived notions that we bring to conversations about Africa in the West and the way in which, just like eyeglasses, we can kind of take those off um, and be aware of the ways in which they kind of narrow or focus our vision. And so I think that um, this question of stereotypical views of Africa are directly challenged um, in the prologue, but that does carry through the remaining sections of the show. So the I and we section, which is the second section in the show, focuses a lot on technology and fashion and how those convey personal identity, group identity, belonging to a subculture. You know, I think the, the idea of how integral technology is um, within Africa and, and for many of the artists and designers in this show who are quite young, how technology gives you a platform to kind of communicate about yourself, your, your community, um, the challenges you're facing, the solutions you found, and kind of spread that out to a global audience, I think is, um, is really kind of something that I think a lot, of, a lot of people may not kind of appreciate going into the exhibition. Um, Likewise, the degree of urbanization in Africa that we're seeing um, that's kind of focused on in the space and object section, the third um, gallery in the show. Uh, I think the, the kind of urban environment and the boom that's hap happening in, in African cities might be um, surprising to many visitors who go in kind of just picturing, you know, the Africa of kind of wide open spaces and safaris and lions and things like that. And then finally, the last section is uh, origin and future, and it, it looks back at colonial histories within Africa, but also ahead to the future. And it's a very kind of optimistic um, vision coming out of Africa and, and really kind of positioning Africa as this hub of experimentation for the 21st century. So I think um, throughout the show, there's this idea of, uh, you know, this Africa that I think many of us going into the exhibition may have a certain set of expectations when you see Africa in the title of a show. Um, and I really hope that by the end of the exhibition, people have just a, a completely different understanding of the continent and its diversity and kind of the breadth of, of creative solutions coming out of Africa and, and just how um, central it should be to, to our conversations about the possibilities, not just of, of design, but you know, for, the, for the entire continent um, in the 21st century. Yeah, there's a real sense here that as well as dealing with big issues, which could be post, you know, it could be colonialism, right. could be poverty in certain aspects, but really there's innovation, there's inspiration, there's cutting edge mm -hmm. kind of excitement going on that's really how you would expect to engage with a lot of different art movements in different countries. But as you said, with Africa, it kind of gets loaded with very specific mm -hmm. um, lenses. Um, I thought well, it's something interesting in the prologue was the map uh, by Kai Krauss. Right, yeah. Um, the True Size of Africa. Could you just quickly sure. mention that for us? Yeah, so the True Size of Africa is a visualization of, um, of the continent of Africa, and um, it demonstrates that you could fit you know, the land masses of the United States, China, um, most of Europe, uh, India, all within the continent of Africa. And it, it works against kind of this Eurocentric understanding of the true size of Africa, um, which is promoted by the Mercator projection and just how dominant that's been in our understanding of geography, basically since the Renaissance period when it was developed to help European merchants and um, explorers kind of circumnavigate the globe in a more direct way. Uh, but the Mercator projection has this fatal flaw, which is 
that uh, land masses that are closest to the poles, so for instance, Europe, um, look much larger, whereas those that lie across the equator, like Africa, look much smaller than they actually are. And so, um, you know, this suited everyone just fine for, <laughs> for a very long time. But I think Kai Krause is trying to underscore just how large the continent of Africa is as a way of kind of encouraging us to think more expansively about Africa within kind of global conversations, you know, for all the focus on um, the US and Europe and China and India in our, our conversations about global issues, um, I think he's really trying to, to position um, Africa as, as uh, you know, given its size, um, perhaps it should be occupying a larger kind of situation within those conversations as Absolutely. well. Yeah. Can we talk about Akira Jones' handkerchiefs? Because I think yeah. they're really interesting in terms of how he's um, the artist situating uh, one one context, so like the West and the art forms and representation, and then bringing in a figure that isn't often seen in that context. And I think that kind of goes hand in hand with what you're saying about you know why you know maybe the continent of Africa is being kind of hasn't isn't brought in, mm -hmm. and he's in his own way it's kind of an intervention. Yeah, yeah. So um, Wale Oyajide is the the head designer for Kerry Jones, and he's very committed in his fashion designs to providing. Um, representation and so there's a series of pocket squares in this exhibition from a collection that he did called the untold renaissance they take kind of imagery from 17th and 18th century European textiles they kind of um, appropriate that imagery but at the same time they critique their exclusion of the perspectives of, of people of color by um, kind of reinserting them as central protagonists in these narratives and so it challenges both kind of the, the authority that we give to historical narratives by kind of underscoring the people who, who are excluded, um, but also I think just how seamlessly someone like you know the the central figure of, of the Madonna um, as a as a dark skinned woman um, how she fits so seamlessly back into that scene as kind of the central figure um, kind of challenges uh, challenges the exclusion of those perspectives and and I think on, in a broader context encourages us to to think more expansively about kind of whose perspectives are um, are excluded and what are we missing out. On when we when we don't consider all perspectives. If we could move into the second room, I and we, you've touched on it a little bit. Um, in in what way is it looking at also uh, universal issues, uh, queer identity, relevant topics right now, or things that have always been relevant but have been ignored across societies? Right. right. So there's. Um, one of the platforms in the I and We section looks specifically at the ways uh, fashion and, and other kind of forms of, of self-expression can convey um, either individual identity, group identity, and um, particularly gender and sexual identity. And so there's a photograph by Zanelli Moholy of um, a lesbian couple embracing, and she's, um, Zanelli Moholy talks about uh, talks about the work as, as visual activism and giving um, giving representation to marginalized groups. So this series being focuses on the lesbian community in South Africa, which although they have equal rights on paper under the constitution, uh, the group often faces discrimination in practice and, um, and are often subject to homophobic violence like corrective rape. Um, there's uh, work that, that looks at um, uh, you know the the kind of adaptations that women make, uh, you know, to to conform to beauty standards. So there's uh, Leonie Vanderweiner's scary beautiful shoes are uh, kind of an exaggeration of you know high heels, foot binding. Um, there's a video of a model kind of trying struggling to walk in these shoes that I think really kind of underscores um, just how kind of distorting these beauty standards are that um, you know for so long we've accepted as just kind of a given and as the norm but when we see them kind of amplified to the extent that she has in this shoe design um, it really kind of uh, is jarring and does make you think about kind of um, what women have subjected themselves to in the name of beauty and then there's also a fantastic three-piece suit by Alifero Sokoki Coleman called the modern evolution suit that addresses this idea of the second shift that many women take on when they get home from their jobs. So, you know, it's a, it's a business suit that you might wear, you know, nine to five in the boardroom, but um, it has a series of adaptations, little pockets that can hold things like, you know, thermometers or, or other kind of domestic or caretaking um, objects. And it has uh, these little zip down breast pockets that um, they show you can accommodate, you know, a breast pump. So it, it's uh, really kind of attempting through design to create a suit that can kind of um, 
address all these different roles and accommodate all the different responsibilities that women take on. Do you think it also accentuates that they have to take that on? Because there's no reason why a man couldn't have a thermometer and a baby's bottle right. in his outfit yep. as well. I mean, he yep. probably should mm -hmm. need it yeah, <laughs> if, so if it's, he's a family person. Yeah, so it's this idea of, of critical design that I think calls attention to social mm -hmm. issues. It's not just... Um, you know, intending. embracing it. It's not just embracing it and saying, you know, well, here's something that can, you know, help you play all these, you know, wear all these hats more easily. I think yeah. she's really, um, through this design, trying to to criticize this, yeah. you know, these these added roles that that women often assume single-handedly. And maybe uh, we could touch on very quickly the hairstyles piece in the second room as well. Yeah. And then we'll move on. Yeah. So. Um, there are a number of kind of historical toeholds throughout the show um, that are um, kind of callbacks to the post-independence moment in the 60s and 70s. And um, the exhibition really draws parallels between the optimism and kind of excitement of that moment and the kind of forward-looking, very kind of future-oriented um, perspective of many of the artists and designers in this show. And so there's... Um, uh, this kind of real interest, I think, right after independence and in a lot of, of African, you know, newly formed African nations, uh, it, this interest in kind of communicating about yourself, communicating about your country, and kind of communicating your hopes for this new nation. And so, um, uh, J.D. Ojai Ojikere is one of the kind of historical toeholds, and he had a multiple decades, I think about 40 year long series called Hairstyles that documented different women's hairstyles in Nigeria, and they have this real kind of sculptural quality to them. So they're, you know, beautiful photographs, but the, the hairstyles themselves convey a lot about um, women's roles and, and places in society and things like that. So it's kind of this, um, uh, you know, we have uh, 21st century um, means of kind of telegramming uh, or telegraphing our identities. So there's, you know, street fashion blogs from South Africa and, and YouTube memes and things like that in this exhibition. But at the same time, there's a, a connection back to the mid 20th century when, um, when there were, uh, when there was a, an interest in conveying identity as well. So I think the, those photos, the photos of someone like Seydou Keita or um, Malik Sidibe mm -hmm. in, um, you know, kind of a, a Bamako nightclub in, in Mali, um, it really suggests not just kind of youth culture and, and this idea of kind of partying as a political act, but also um, self, you know, self presentation and, and performing for the cameras as, as a means of kind of communicating not just your individual identity, but kind of the identity of your your nation as a whole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I found very especially with the hair mm -hmm. that it was amazing how really the air, the hair can is also becomes an art form, a sculpture in itself, and it has an architecture to it. Right. So in those photographs, you see something that could almost be some kind of geometric Buckminster Fuller, like futuristic yeah. structure. And I thought that that was incredibly um, inspiring. You could do that with your own body, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it was just with the hair. Yeah. So moving into the third section, uh, personal versus urban right. environment. Right. Um, can we talk about the three photographs that are uh, uh, different interpretations of uh, the Ponty City mm -hmm. in Johannesburg. Yeah, so the, it's uh, a series of three light boxes by the photographers Mikhail Sabatsky and Patrick Waterhouse, and they documented between 2008 and 2010 every television set, every door, and every window in the Ponty City um, apartment building. And Ponty City is a 54 story tall apartment building, it's the tallest um, residential building in the whole continent of Africa, and it's kind of a masterpiece of, of brutalist architecture. It's this 54-story tall concrete cylinder. It was built in 1975 under apartheid for whites only and as kind of a luxury, luxury housing um, building. Uh, but very quickly, of course, you know, with the, the Soweto uprisings, um, global uh, economic boycotts of South Africa, um, Ponte City, uh, kind of uh, the neighborhood around it suffered um, as a result of kind of economic sanctions on, on South Africa. Um, Ponzi City, because of its sheer scale, actually was able to integrate um, before the fall of apartheid because apartheid just could not be enforced in a building with, you know, 600 units. And um, so Ponzi City has always um, kind of represented a toehold in uh, the center city of, of Johannesburg for people who want to live live where they work. Um, and so uh, Ponzi City remains to this day, you know, in spite of having this, um, you know, a very kind of checkered past, um, uh, it remains to this day kind of a, a beacon of, um, of, of hope and, and a gateway to the city for, um, 
you know, not just um, black South Africans who want to, you know, move into um, Johannesburg, but also um, immigrants as well. Uh, and that way it kind of has, has a very interesting story to tell. And um, the Patrick Waterhouse and Mikhail Sabatsky photographs have, they're I think about 12 feet tall each, and so they give you this um, kind of towering, um, the, the impact of the, the building itself but uh, every photograph is laid out as it would appear within the building. And so in that way, it kind of presents um, a collective portrait of Ponte City and the people who live in it and kind of their, their hopes and their aspirations. Well, it's, it's incredibly stunning just like how large it is and how it's illuminated as well. And you really feel like it's a beacon, but yeah. it's also kind of this metropolis. Right. So I think it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much yeah, for talking pleasure. to me today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. There's so much. I can't stress for audiences how much there is to, to take in. Okay. And your catalogue has amazing essays. Thank so yeah. everything that we didn't get to cover right. is, is there <laughs> exactly. for them to discover. So thank you so much. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. We want to thank Claire for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to blantonmuseum.org. That's it for it this week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar.